Hi, just a follow up video to the teardown of this Fleur TG165 visual thermometer or thermal imaging camera and you can see it's still in pieces because it was a real bastard to get apart and I just want to cover a few things which um, have come to light since the uh, previous video was shot so let's take a look at them. Now the first one of course was that I basically completely destroyed this thing taking it apart and there were several uh, reasons that led me down that path. There were the two screws here of course and I sort of guessed that there might have been screws on the front here so I went down that path to try and uh, take off the front bezel and all that sort of stuff and that didn't work and then it looked like I could prise the front off and that didn't work and everything else and one of the first things I did try was to actually pry out the um, LCD. You can probably see a couple of marks in there from where I probably had a uh, go at that and it didn't seem to budge at all. So um, uh, it, you know a few design things led me down the path to uh, basically just ripping the whole thing apart but as it turns out the four screw holes in there the, the screws actually do go through the front so this screen and problem and maybe the rubber is applied after the uh, fact but it looks like maybe it comes out through the plastic there so I just wanted to actually poke through those holes and see if that's a way to get this thing open so let's see if I can poke here we go poke through a hole here maybe uh, uh, poking through I can feel that I'm hitting something is it the screen I think it is seems to oh yeah yep yeah, yep yeah. ah oh, geez I'm putting a lot of force on that yeah look I could feel yeah it's coming off it's coming off the screen is coming off so it looks like it is glued on there so probably looks like the way to get that off if you want to play around and modify your one is to um, heat it up uh, probably would actually release the glue on there most likely and allow you to get a suction cup in there or maybe um, you know a knife or something in there a little uh, plastic pry bar to lift up that I probably don't think you're going to be able to do it without heating it up although I haven't uh, tested that obviously this one still has a screw in it so several people were right in that geez it's not easy there we go there we go it is there we go it is stuck down there we go it's out it's out so that is the way yeah yep nice okay so there you go there's the four screws screw holes right there so if you want to do this that's the way to do it and it was Actually, yeah, there we go. It's got an adhesive back on that. So that should have been obvious, but yeah, I missed it. Oops. Well, at least nobody else has to destroy their uh, TG165. If you want to take it apart, yep, you can actually get that screen out. Well, you might be able to get a knife under there and pry it out, but I'd recommend probably trying to uh, heat it up and loosen the glue on there perhaps. But just be careful, you don't want to ruin your LCD or anything like that. And also, when I was uh, playing around with that, trying to prise that screen out to begin with, um, it did seem as though the rubber was like uh, over molded over the top of that screen. That doesn't seem to be the case, although it, it maybe is a bit. I mean, it's got a lip. I think it does have a lip. So it is it is sort of, uh, does over mold it a bit. So that's sort of what fooled me into thinking that, you know, that wasn't the solution to actually get that screen out. So, yeah, it is, but still, it's a uh, pain in the ass. They should have made this battery much easier to replace. That's just stupid. Now, the other thing I missed, of course, is the shutter, because I was expecting an external shutter on this thing over the inside of the lens or something like that. There we go, you just saw the shutter close there. It turns out this actually does have a micro shutter attachment built onto the top of this. And this is not, uh, it's not really like a proper external shutter, but it's actually a purpose design clip-on attachment. And if I actually looked at the photo of the module in the data sheet, it would have been fairly obvious that it was a clip-on attachment. I noticed that it did have something clipped on the top, but I just thought that was a natural part of the lepton package here. But as it turns out, no, this has an optional 
uh, which the data sheet doesn't tell you about. It just says, you know, it supports an external shutter. It doesn't say that it's a micro shutter actually on this thing. And that's what that coil was on the top that we saw. And there's a, there's a little shutter inside there. And I'll get you to close up on this in a minute. But occasionally, it will actually close over. And you must have, if you were watching, you would have seen it before, close over. And I don't know, I'm probably not going to be able to make it do it because it does seem to be quite random. But uh, anyway, even if I try and heat it up there, I'm not sure it's going to uh, do it. Oh, there we go. It just closed. It just blinked. And uh, yeah, it, it does the compensation. And then, did, so I completely missed that. It does have a shutter because I was expecting like a huge external shutter like they've got on the Fleur one and other thermal imaging cameras. But this thing, it's so cute little tiny micro shutter. Now, of course, I wasn't expecting it to have a shutter because the data sheet actually says that it has automatic uh, temperature compensation and other stuff. And really, because it's not actually uh, measuring the data coming out of this thing, I didn't think it would need it. So I'm quite surprised that it does actually have a shutter. But they've gone for this little, um, presumably cheaper and simpler, um, integrated clip-on shutter on the top. And you can see... That little thing over there will, when it shutters closed, hopefully I'll get it. I'll be like, we might have to wait until it does it. But uh, anyway, it'll blink and a shutter will come across and it'll do some, it'll take about, you know, half a second to do a uh, thermal correction there. There we go, it just blinked. <laughs> there we go. So beautiful. So that's got an internal surface on it that has a, a nice even thermal temperature gradient on it, like a black body surface, uh, so to speak, so that it covers it over and it can do some compensation so it has uniform temperature across all of the sensor. So what it's basically doing here is what's called a NUC correction or non-uniformity correction or flat field correction uh, because the sensor itself is factory calibrated at temperature to give an ex well as flat a field as possible so if you if you're measuring a black body for example or a surface that's all at the one nice uniform temperature then you should get a nice uniform temperature mapping out of the device but uh, due to the inherent nature of the physics of it and everything else, they uh, individual pixels tend to drift around and do all sorts of weird and wonderful things. So you can end up with grainy images and blotch, blotchy images depending on the thermal gradient. So if you cycle the thing through thermal temperatures and things like that, it can affect the performance of these sensors. And so uh, periodically, it's got an internal uh, temperature sensor in there and it knows when it's starting to drift and there is actually a status output in the status stream, the serial status stream of this sensor that actually tells the microcontroller that, hey, I think you should do a nut correction or a flat field, uh, flat field correction and then the microcontroller can command the shutter to come in and I'm not sure if the shutter is actually like a is probably two separate what well, must be two separate pins on that uh, on the actual on the physical connector down in there so I believe that the microcontroller then instructs it instructs it under software control to do that shutter compensations. So I don't think that the actual lepton sensor is itself actually commanding that uh, NUC compensation or flat field compensation there. I think that it's sending the command to the microcontroller and it's saying, hey, I think you should do this. And then the micro switches on that uh, solenoid, which then, I can't make it do it again, makes it blink and uh, recompensates the thing and then updates the internal calibration tables because once that window comes over the top there, then it knows it's got a nice flat surface even temperature surface to uh, actually calibrate against and it updates the internal calibration tables and everything's hunky-dory so it determines that it has to do that once in a while. Now the lepton sensor itself actually has what's called a uh, scene based non-uniformity correction or NUC correction in it where if you're moving around and your image is moving like this then it can do some software 
uh, stuff to actually compensate on the fly and it's not really uh, you know so it doesn't really need that external shutter uh, even field compensation to actually do that so it can pretty much do that in in software but when you uh, are measuring and looking at a static field that doesn't move then uh, like if you got the thing mounted on a tripod for example this thing does have a tripod mount I'm not sure why because I thought the you know the major use uh, case scenario for this thing was actually uh, turn it on you know take a scan around take a measurement boom turn it off and that's it all sort of handheld use so I'm not sure why this thing has a tripod mount and the proper thermal camera the Fleur E4 and E8 they don't have a tripod mount so it's real and they have a really you know a proper big huge external shutter oops timeouts just switched on so I'm actually very surprised that it, you know, they went to the effort to have this shutter, especially when they're they're not doing it, they're not taking that temperature. As I said, isn't coming from the lepton sensor. The uh, scale, there's no scale over here. So I'm I'm surprised that they bothered to do that when this thing is just going to be used. You know, switch it on for a couple of minutes, take a few measurements, and switch it off. So. It's it's rather unusual. I don't know, but they decided that they needed it. Maybe there maybe there'll be a firmware update in the future. But in any case, if you wanted to maybe hack the uh, firmware on the thing, and you could maybe add some scale functions and read the data out of the uh, lepton sensor, that's certainly possible. And with a shutter in there, it may not. Oh, there it goes. It just blinked. May not be as good in performance as a proper uh, external shutter, but you know, hey, it's probably good enough for uh, the low-end market that they're aiming for here with this thing. And if we turn the power on here, you'll notice that a couple of seconds after powering on, it should blink. There we go. And that is, it does the calibration, flat field compensation, and that's pretty consistent if I turn it turn it on, boom, here it goes, there we go, that's pretty consistent. So it does at least one at a fixed time after power on, uh, that could be the lepton sensor actually instructing, sending the command out, or the micro might just go, well, let's just do one, camera's been turned on, you know, everything's fine, but after that, it does seem pretty random, it's not like a time-based uh, thing at all. So one thing I wanted to test is, does it actually do the calibration more frequently if it's going through a fairly quick uh, ambient thermal ramp. So, you know, I'm here in the lab and it's, you know, 23 degrees or something like that, and it's pretty darn uh, constant. And if I turn the aircon on, you know, it's constant within, it cycles within half a degree Celsius or something like that. So maybe it's not drifting all that uh, much, and you wouldn't expect it to, just at an ambient temperature like this. So uh, what I'm going to do is actually stick it in the uh, thermal chamber. I've already got the thermal chamber heated up to 60 degrees, so I'm basically moving it from the lab environment into a warmer air environment and you know I, I don't obviously have a temperature sensor on this or inside this I'm not sort of reading a temperature out of the lepton sensor itself you can actually get the temperature data out of this it does actually come out of the serial uh, stream on the thing but I'm not going to go to that amount of trouble here I'm just going to put it in and see if it does actually do that uh, compensation and calibration uh, more frequently when it's ramping through a temperature. So let's give that a go. So here's my little lab thermal chamber, which is seen in a video a long, long time ago. It's at 59 degrees Celsius inside. It's had time to uh, warm up. So I'm going to uh, just open the door, whack it inside, and then actually watch it. It'll take time for the uh, heat to penetrate the lepton sensor, of course, to actually build up th thermal equilibrium inside and change that sort of thing. But I just want to see if then it actually uh, you know it calibrates more often just by having the same measuring the same field image it'll be like measuring well outside here so I'll be able to wave my hands around and uh, and but see if just ramping that temperature up makes a difference there we go 55 <laughs> yep so let me uh, there we go and I can uh, no I can't wave my hand it's too far in sorry but uh, we'll be able to see the shutter there we'll be able to see it blink so it's just got a uniform field that I said there we go it blinked so let's see if it uh, blinks again you can see the image there changing that's interesting oh there we go yeah it only took 17 seconds so I think it might that's certainly more frequently than more frequent than what I was getting before but we've only got a couple of data points there so that doesn't help 
Come on. Yeah, there we go. Yes, 17 seconds again. Inter oh, okay. Oh, well, it's a bit more than 17, actually. My stopwatch is... Uh, I have to reset it, but come on. You can blink. You can do it. Yep, there we go. 20 again. So it seems to be doing it fairly consistently. Reset. So it's like 25 seconds by the time I actually start it. Reset my stopwatch and start it again. Another 10 seconds. I think it might do it again. So that's interesting data that that temperature inside, it would be ramping up inside the lepton sensor. It should do it right about now. Come on. Come on. Don't make a fool out of me. Although, you know, it's not going to be a linear ramp. There we go. Uh, that one took a bit longer, I think. But it's certainly much more frequent than before. I think that's pretty much proven that. That it's uh, certainly based on the ambient temperature is causing it to compensate more frequently. Because I can go for several minutes easily uh, when it was at ambient room temperature and it didn't operate the shutter. There we go. That one took longer again. So it's getting progressive, taking progressively longer. And once it reaches thermal equilibrium in there, like inside the lepton sensor is actually brought up to uh, the same temperature as inside the thermal chamber, then, well, yeah, I'd expect um, it to uh, get back to just being uh, at the same update rate as what we got in the ambience. So I think we've proven there that... Uh, Putting it in a ramping ambient environment does, well, pretty much exactly what you'd expect. You'd expect it to do more frequent uh, compensation because it's got an internal temperature sensor in that lepton. It knows there could be another, like, little SOT23 temperature sensor on the PCB inside the uh, main board. I don't know whether or not that. But I basically, the uh, lepton sensor itself is capable of knowing when it needs that compensation. As I said, can send out a serial command uh, telling the micro that it needs to do it and the micro will decide if it wants to command that so if you didn't want the thing to do that we could actually disable that you could probably hack the software to disable or of course you could do a hardware mod to disable that shutter if you found it really annoying and I've taken it back out here and uh, I expect it to update as it cools back down it should update uh, probably just as frequently as what it did before there we go, that was our first one. I'm going to time it. There you go, that, that took 46 seconds there to uh, activate that shutter. And there you go, that second one took a minute and three seconds. So it's getting progressively longer. Alright, it's been going for three and a half minutes now, and still nothing. It's, uh, yep, so it's well and truly a happy little camper sitting there thinking, I don't need to do any correction whatsoever. Not a problem. I'm happy with this ambient, uh, non-changing ambient temperature. Nothing's drifting. Everything's just hunky-dory inside my array. Eh, I'm not going to wait any longer. This is ridiculous. So I thought we'd just take a look at, see if we can actually see that shutter and uh, unclip that top part of it. So I'll take it out of its lovely little socket there and uh, try and unclip it. Because you can see it just clips on, the, clips on the top there. So we should be able to do that. This is trick. I, hope I, don't, oy, I was going to say, I hope I don't break it because I'm looking at the camera screen here when I'm doing this sort of stuff. No. There we go. There's the entire assembly. Ah, very nice. Very nice. I thought, you know, I was, thought maybe springs would all come out, but no, it's just making contact with those two pads there. So there's the proper, there's the actual lepton sensor, which is what you see in the data sheet. And, uh, this thing, of course, um, has only shown its ugly head on this TG165. It's certainly not in the Fleur 1. As I said, it uses a huge external shutter. This is still an external shutter, but it's, you know, a micro shutter designed to, purpose designed to clip on the front. So that is, that's very nice. I like that. Well engineered. And the other thing to note too is that 
its performance can't be that great because for this thing to be effective and, and a truly good uh, calibration shutter is that it needs to have a temperature sensor directly on the shutter which comes over so you know precisely what that value is and if you look inside a proper thermal camera they have like a big aluminium plate or something like that that comes over and it's you know painted matte black and all that sort of stuff um, and it's got a temperature sensor directly embedded on that plate so it's a uniform temperature but this thing of course is just nothing it's just probably a plastic I, I don't know what material is in there anyway it doesn't matter there the only connections going over are the coil of course to actually actuate the shutter there so it's got no temperature sensor so you've got to rely on the internal temperature sensor inside the lepton sensor and yeah well you know it's not going to be as good as a proper external calibration shutter so it might work fine for non-uniformity correction, of course, because the plate will be at the one temperature, but it, you know, it probably, for absolute calibration, it's, um, you know, to a measured ambient temperature, it's not going to be that great. Now, on here it looks like the lines for the actuation coil actually go down to the corresponding pins down in here, but they don't. I've actually uh, checked, I've measured it, and also checked the pin out of the device, and no, that pin and that pin are part of the MIPI interface, so they're nothing to do with this thing. But obviously, there is no pin out on the device that actually, um, because I've got the pin out for the thing from the data sheet, so I don't, I, there is no pin which says, you know, shutter, actuation there's no separate pins for that so what I think's going on is it must be doing it through the chip has uh, various GPIO just general purpose IO that can be configured for anything so it must be driving that so the microcontroller could still do it the microcontroller could still get the command uh, because this as I said this will send out a command when it thinks it need or a status bit when it thinks it needs, well, when it knows it needs to do a compensation, and then because it's uh, drifted, it's got an internal temp sensor, and it can actually detect noise and or do all sorts of probably some tricky software involved in that. But it knows that it needs a compensation, so it can send that out via the um, serial interface, and then the micro can still read that and go, okay, yeah, I agree. Let's do a shutter. Uh, compensation let's activate the shutter so then it commands one of the GPI to switch one of the GPI O pins inside the unit which then drives the coil it must be it and because it's not on the pin out now if you are going to probe a flat flex connector like this then don't go down and probe these pins down here like this because your probe can easily slip off and then short out two pins together what you need to do is probe the back in there and that's actually recessed like that so it's impossible to short out your pin so you can probe around oh oh I just saw some data there so it's got the plastic down separating them in there so you can really get in there and probe along without you can almost drag the thing along without uh, actually shorting anything out so eh, there's a little tip and I'm trying to buzz out the pinouts on this, and trust me, it's a real pain in the ass. You've got to take the lepton out of the socket. You've got to hold one probe in there, use the right tongue angle, get on the other side, and ah, oh, it's ah, it's horrible. But I'm getting there. Well, that was a real pain. But anyway, I confirmed a few things here. Is that uh, the SCL and SDA, the I squared C uh, command data bus, is actually connected, so we can probe that. But I have probed these pins before and there doesn't seem to be anything on there. Anyway, they are connected through to the module. By the way, this is the pin out on the flat flex over here. And this is the uh, lepton uh, module over here. And I can also confirm that they're using video over SPI. They're not using the MIPI interface. Definitely the SPI bus. They've got SPI chip select connected. They've got SPI clock, of course. And they've got SPI uh, MOSI, the output pin. So, uh, i.e. output from the lepton module into the microcontroller but there is no uh, MISO pin so there's no input on that coming back into the module okay so I've got it uh, powered up and it works works just a treat and I can probe some things here so let's have a look at the I squared C line one two three four 
that's the fourth pin along that's supposed to be the SDA pin and you can see there's no activity there whatsoever I'm triggering right in the middle of that and there's just nothing on the uh, SDA line at all I haven't waited long enough to see if it actually sends a command on that when the um, shutter uh, changes but it's got to read data back out of that to get that shutter information I thought anyway well to get the information that it requires a uh, NUC event so uh, yeah there's nothing on there and um, and the SDA and the I squared C clock as well that was just me changing pins there that's why it triggered and there's absolutely nothing on the clock either it's just sitting high so zip and if I actually turn the power off okay and I turn the power back on let's oh hang on I'll turn the power on oh there we go we triggered something well it went high when I actually pushed there we go if I just push the power button once it actually goes high there we let's have a look at that so there we go so if I press uh, hold down that power button it actually goes the clock line on the I squared C goes high but uh, what I want to do hang on oh, I've got to have three hands here so turn it on boom and oh what have I got uh, something it went low there but it's the clock line you know it's not like it's clocking um, I squared C data at all so we're getting nothing on that I squared C bus zip and that includes when the shutter goes actually because the shutter is going to go as we saw before like uh, two seconds after boot up so there's just there's just nothing there and that's the data out of the module there on the SPI so that's that's video over SPI and you can see see the packets there so it's sending and we can actually we should be able to get the update rate on that should we so if we capture that we're getting packet bursts of video here uh, with a spacing of 38.5 milliseconds works out to about uh, 26 uh, times per second we, we're getting that it looks like are we getting 26 frames per second from that lepton sensor I'm not entirely sure and if we have a look at the waveform here that we've captured one of those big packets those happen every 20 uh, those happen 26 times per second then we've got some higher frequency content here so if we zoom in on that and uh, whoop, here we go zoom in on that you can see that we've got some SPI stuff happening in here and if we go along scoot along we can see that then it changes over at that point to you know larger amounts of most likely the video data and of course this is an 80 by 60 sensor and well what do we get if we look at that high frequency content there I've counted those packets in there and bingo we get 60 of them so each one of those little bursts in there is one complete line of data and of course if we go into there we'll no doubt find there's 80 uh, bits of information in there so too easy yeah it is confirmed it's not giving out any uh, more information than the claimed 80 by 60 and of course there's not going to be a single bit in there there's going to be 80 pieces of information for each individual uh, sensor dot in there of course it's not just an on off uh, type thing there's going to be a value in there so there's going to be 80 words of uh, information within that and then each one of those is repeated as we said 60 times across here for each line of information and all this stuff at the start is some other sort of data actually there's some really high frequency content in there there's a lot of information within each one of those look at that there's there's an absolute ton of information so look I don't have access to the uh, there's a separate document apparently from Fleur that is the like the information like the serial protocol interface and all that sort of stuff and I don't have access to that so yeah I'm not gonna speculate exactly what the data is but as we saw we definitely did get 60 
packets of information there. So that is, and this one's actually shorter. So there's, you know, there's no surprise to find that that would be 60 lines of information in there. That's pretty certain, I think. So there you go. That's just some more playing around with this thing. I was very surprised that there's basically nothing on that I squared C bus. I couldn't find anything when the shutter activates on there, when it powers up, just nothing. But it is actually connected through. So maybe they are, you know, got a future use for that thing. I don't know, but it's basically just spitting everything out from the lepton uh, sensor. It doesn't seem to be actually getting anything in. So um, the shutter in there is, um, I believe, it looks like it is actually controlled by the lepton uh, sensor itself, rather than, uh, you know, sending the uh, command, as I said, back to the microcontroller and then the microcontroller deciding that it's going to activate the shutter. No, it looks like it's um, done in there because it doesn't seem to be any information going back to the lepton sensor at all, which is really interesting. Anyway, um, yeah, it requires, you know, if you really wanted to go into it, it requires a lot more information and having access to those uh, serial protocol documents would be very nice as well. Anyway, that was just a follow-up. Hasn't been a quick one. It's probably like 30 minutes or something. Anyway, hope you enjoyed it. Catch you next time. Bye.